great words of comfort and promise to your people to recognize that you and you alone are faithful forever, perfect in love, and over all the circumstances in our life, both good and bad, you are sovereign. And so we praise you. We would ask, God, your blessing upon your word as it is preached. Help us to come to this point in our worship with an open heart to what you want us to glean this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Every once in a while, something happens that surprises me. You guys know what I mean? Like every so often, something occurs that, frankly, I, I just didn't see it coming. Not long ago, Lori and I went to my favorite barbecue place in Kansas City. I get to pick the restaurant like once a year. Anyway, Carl and Paula Stevens found it. I would tell you where it is, but then you might start going there and I'd have to wait longer and I'd have to kill you. But it is the best barbecue in Kansas City. It's called Slaps and it's on Central Avenue in KCK. Just in case you're wondering, it's not in the Bible, but I'm sure that Slaps is going to cater the dinners in heaven. It's that good. It is one of the many things that makes our city so great. I have two friends, Tom Willoughby and Wesley Vance. That's it, two friends. But anyway, we used to go to Slaps all the time when all three of us were pastoring in the Kansas City area, and then Tom had to be all spiritual and follow his calling and move to South Carolina to be a professor in a Baptist university. What a slacker, but I digress. So I'm standing in line at Slaps, and I'm, I'm wearing what happens to be my favorite Kansas City Royals t-shirt. It's the light blue one, which I think, for the record, is like the classic look. Full disclosure, I'm also wearing a mask, so part of my face is covered. And the guy that is standing behind the counter keeps looking at me, really kind of weird, has this really strange look on his face. I don't think a whole lot about it at first, but I, I'm watching and he keeps looking at me really funny and I'm in KCK. So I'm thinking, I wonder if the guy behind me has a gun out or something. But the guy at the counter didn't look afraid. So when I finally got to the counter and it was my turn to order, the guy that was working grinned, and you guys are gonna love this, and he said, oh man, for the longest time when you were standing in line, I thought you were George Brett. <laughs> now my first thought was, George has been shrinking in height, and he's put on a little weight since his baseball playing days. At any rate, we kind of laughed, and I thought I would be fine to keep my looks and take George's money. Then we sat down to eat. Every once in a while, something happens that surprises me. Well, in our text for today, something happened that really surprised a lot of people, I'm sure. So let's get to it. Elephants in the room when disappointment trumps hope. This is part four, and we're in John chapter 11, beginning with verse 38. If you're able, I will invite you to stand, please, for the reading of God's word. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Thank you so much. You may be seated. When disappointment trumps hope. So today we are finishing a series of sermons called Elephants in the Room where we've talked about the authority of the Bible and the sanctity of life. We've talked about marriage, singleness, so-called gay marriage, divorce, remarriage, cohabitation, gambling, depression, suicide, the resurrection, heaven and hell 
homosexuality, racism, sexism, gender bending, money and giving, the discipline from God, as well as local church discipline. We talked about social media and how we speak, as well as church discipline and creation versus evolution, eternal security, what that means and what it doesn't. We talked about wisdom for dating, grief, attitude during hard times, politics, immigration, gluttony, death, burial versus cremation, and sexual abuse, in particular, what the church ought to be doing about it. And then we dealt with alcohol and marijuana, and a pandemic came along, so I addressed it in a series with a sermon called A Christian Response to a Pandemic. I thought that was a pretty clever title. Yes. Then we took a little break from the elephants, and now we're going to finish it up, Lord willing, these last 30 minutes. The last three weeks, we've been dealing with another elephant. Why, why don't things work out the way we think they should? Why doesn't God fix everything for the people who love Him? In other words, what do you do when disappointment trumps hope? Well, let's take a moment to review. Three weeks ago, we said, as we worked through John 11, we said, God knows your troubles. Jesus' response isn't always what's expected. Jesus' response isn't always what's expected again. When you're God or when you know God, there's no need to panic. And then two weeks ago, I took a detour and we said, if we're not careful, we miss the meaning of what God is saying to us in our time of disappointment. Then we said, Jesus has impeccable timing. Jesus has command presence and Jesus has ultimate answers. And then last week when we were together, we noted Jesus is accessible, yet death still visits his friends. Jesus is compassionate, yet grief still visits his friends. And we finished by saying Jesus is outraged, yet sin still visits his friends. Let's now get to the task at hand from the text at hand. First of all, I want you to recognize Jesus can tackle hopeless situations. Jesus can tackle hopeless situations. Look with me, please, at verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus can tackle hopeless situations. Jesus walks to the tomb itself. No doubt this was an eerie experience for him, knowing something of what was yet to come in his own life sooner rather than later. Verse 38 reminds us, it tells us that, deep, that he was deeply moved again. I won't belabor the point from last week, but suffice it to say, Jesus isn't just dealing with a slight distraction here. He's not just a little bit off his game. There is a palpable feeling, a depth of emotion about all of this that I don't think any of us could ever even begin to fathom. The phrase, you'll recall, deeply moved, denotes anger and outrage and indignation. Jesus is furious about the issue of death. So Jesus is now at the tomb, no doubt, part of the anger that he is feeling is that he is directly confronting his opponent, death and the grave. So if you'll indulge me for a moment, let me offer just a quick history lesson about burial and mourning in those days. In those days, there would be great wailing and crying, very demonstrative in terms of grieving. Some would likely have been beating their chests in grief. Flute players were also often hired to be part of the mourning process. Formal mourning lasted seven days. In Hebrew, this is known as the Shabba. It began on the burial day, which was also the very same day that death occurred in those days. Lazarus was likely buried in a rock-cut tomb, likely inside a cave room, probably about 10 to 15 feet square. There were benches carved in stone along the inner walls. The body of the deceased was prepared there and laid in a burial tunnel that was about six feet deep and was left there to decompose. Typically, about a year later, the body was removed and the bones placed in a burial box, an ossuary. The tomb was closed and then opened again for further burials with a stone shaped like a wheel that rolled and was the right size to cover up the entrance. So when Jesus arrives, the body of Jesus or the body of Lazarus has been buried and the tomb is closed. The wheel-shaped stone has been rolled in front of the entrance. Martha even reminds Jesus that Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. In other words, 
This is not a good time to roll back the stone. As odd as this may be, there was an early medieval Jewish tradition that consisted of Jews returning to the grave site after three days to check to see if the person might, in fact, be living. All of this account in Scripture, everything that John tells us, is to highlight, it is to underline the reality that Lazarus is, in fact, truly dead. The body has been in the tomb four days. There is an odor present in the tomb, or as the old King James Version would say it, Behold, he stinketh. <laughs> now you know why I don't preach from the King James Version. But anyway, there's an odor present in the tomb that will demonstrate that the body has been there four days. You guys remember the Wizard of Oz? There's a section in the movie where one of the witches dies, and the little man, who is the coroner, has to come out, and he, he delivers this sort of sing-song line to highlight the reality that the witch is dead. And the line he delivers in that very unique voice, which I am so tempted to do right now, but I'm, I'm a dignified man, so I'll not do that. He says... She's not only merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. She's not only merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. What is taking place here in John 11 is similar, only it's not fiction, and it's a whole lot stronger. John has highlighted several different things to point out unequivocally that Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, is not merely dead. He's really most sincerely dead. In other words, this is hopeless. Nobody is thinking Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. It's game over, done deal. Unless there would be divine intervention. This is all hopeless. But remember, Jesus can tackle hopeless situations. Some of you guys need that reminder today. Jesus can tackle hopeless situations. I need that reminder today too. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're up against. It might be related to something of economic in nature. It might be a relationship challenge that you're dealing with. You might be facing a health challenge, and you know that if there's not divine intervention, you know the outcome is going to be bad from the human earthly perspective. You might be dealing with all kinds of financial strain. A lot of people have been thrust into a negative scenario because of what's going on in our culture. Maybe you've been laid off at your job, and all of these things are absolutely terrible. But I think, I think anyway, we would all agree that the worst case scenario is losing someone we love in death. Nothing in that job, financial, none of that compares to that kind of loss. I told you guys a couple of weeks ago about a man I knew that had killed himself, and before that happened, he had been released from his job. Connected to that, there was some embarrassment, some somewhat public humiliation and private recompense. It was a hard line this guy had to walk. And I'm sure that he felt awful, and his family felt awful, and he felt more awful because his family felt awful. But you know what? I will guarantee his family would give anything in the world to have him back even with every challenge that they would have faced into the future, even with the embarrassment, even with the humiliation, even with the shame, a loss of money or a job, as terrible as that is, saying goodbye to prestige and prominence, as painful as that may be, doesn't even begin to compare to the loss of life. Right? So John is here offering a worst-case scenario. Lazarus has died. Certainly there could be no loss any greater for those that knew him and loved him. But now it's time for some good news, right? Enter Jesus. Jesus specializes in desperate circumstances, even death, remember? So the point is, 
If Jesus doesn't heal you or your loved one who is facing death, if they believed in him, they're made whole, made well, totally well. And it will happen to you too if, if you believe in Jesus. We pass through a passageway we call death into a forever life we call eternity with Jesus and all good things. Now I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that thought because we need to. So hold that thought. Everybody say eternity with Jesus. Would you say that with me? Eternity with Jesus. Hold that thought. Jesus can tackle hopeless situations. Secondly, Jesus' intervention in hopeless situations will always be for the glory of God. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus' intervention in hopeless situations will always be for the glory of God. Ultimately, God is given glory as Jesus ends up performing this wonderful miracle. But the main glory that is given to God, and please don't miss this, the main glory that is given to God, even as recorded in these moments, is not just because Lazarus is being raised from the dead. No. The main glory that is given to God is when the people believe God sent Jesus. That's the crux of the whole issue here. That's the big moment in the story, believe it or not. So listen to me. Live like a Christian. I know that's a funny thing for a pastor to say, right? Live like a Christian. What I mean is do the things that you think and even those outside in the outside world think that Christians ought to do. Help the poor, feed the hungry, take care of orphans and widows, give away some of your stuff, live with purpose and less worldly entanglements. Don't cuss, don't spit, don't get drunk, and all that other stuff, really. Okay, got it? Moralism out of the way. Got it? That's all great. But here's the real kicker. Doing or not doing those things is not what brings God the most glory. It's belief. It's belief that Jesus was sent into the world by the Father. So sure, live right, do well, do some good, but more importantly, than keeping the checklist of all of those things, more important than all of that, listen to me, is belief in Jesus. You want to glorify God? Believe. Can I tell you guys something? I'm really good at this. <laughs> not preaching. I'm not saying I'm good at preaching. I'm not stupid. I mean, not that stupid. I'm really good at this. I am a wonderful professional Christian. I've never hit my wife. Never cheated on my wife. I didn't beat my kids. I thought about it, but repented. I've never plagiarized another man's sermon. I don't even speed intentionally. I read the Bible every day because the legalist in me tells me that if I don't, I'll get the plague and die. Or worse, worse than that, I'm scared to death that one of you guys might ask me if I've read the Bible that day, and I'll have to tell the truth or lie about it, and I am so messed up, I'm not even sure some days which would be worse. I'm really good at being good. I am. But listen to me. That doesn't matter a bit. It's all garbage. My righteousness, my right, everything good that I might be able to do, if not always connected back to Jesus, it is absolutely useless. Now, lest you misunderstand me, what I just told you guys is I'm a whole lot worse than you are. So don't take that the other way. Let the performance piece of your piety go. Would you rest in Jesus for once in your life? 
In other words, don't focus on just doing the right thing. As important as doing the right things actually would be, focus on being connected with Jesus. God is most glorified in in us, as has been said, when we are most satisfied in Him. Dr. Steve Brown says this so well. He takes a moment to describe his own denominational and theological labels, and he points out how many of us, in all of our efforts to be serious about our faith, end up missing out on the joy. He writes, I'm a Calvinist and Reformed, and we Calvinists do things decently and in order. We don't speak in tongues, tell jokes, or dance. But if we do, we don't do any of that very well. We believe that if you get the facts right, then it's enough. It's not. It's not nearly enough. So often we, and a lot of serious Christians who aren't Reformed, know the words, but miss the melody. Man, did you get that? Lots of Christians know the words, but miss the melody. In other words, we hear the music, we just can't bring ourselves to dance. Now, I know I lost all you guys because you're Baptists when I said dance. But you get the point? Rest in Him. Jesus can tackle hopeless situations. Jesus' intervention in hopeless situations will always be for the glory of God. Thirdly and finally, Jesus can speak a word and everything changes. Verse 43, When He had said these things, He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there to see that? Lazarus, come out. I heard my dad say on more than one occasion, if Jesus had not said Lazarus before saying come out, his word was so powerful that every grave on the planet would have emptied in that moment. If this were seen from a movie, this would be where the orchestra swells to a powerful crescendo, complete with trumpets and timpani, hailing King Jesus as Lazarus is released from the bonds of death. Jesus speaks, and everything, everything changes. Some of us need that reminder. I need this reminder. When you come to Jesus, Jesus speaks forgiveness and love and purpose not just over your life, but more accurately, into your life. Man, that was worth the price of admission this morning. You know why some Christians are so miserable? You know, some of us are, right? You know why some Christians are so miserable? Because they're not willing to cooperate with the Jesus on the inside. Rather than living to die to self, a lot of believers live to sort of squelch the Savior within. You guys ever read the Bible? You ever read church history at all? You know that the people of God faced a whole lot worse than COVID-19, right? You know, if you've read the Bible or if you've read church history, you know that political corruption and ridiculous leadership on the world scene are as much kin to the Christian faith as candles are to Christmas Eve. It's part of our life. This is not anything new. Now, I'm going to take a minute, and I want to contrast something Something from the church of today with the words of Paul. You guys have been great, by the way, okay? I don't think that this will generally hit you. But the church generally, across the board, has said some things like this. Now, I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about, this is like speaking for a friend, asking for a friend. I'm saying this for a friend. The church in America generally has been saying things like, I'll never get used to this schedule. I'm not going to wear a mask. Who do they think they are? Or, I can't believe they're not wearing a mask. Who do they think they are? 
When are things going to get back to normal? How come the pastor talked about racism? How come the pastor didn't talk about racism? How come the pastor always talks about obeying the law? How come the pastor doesn't talk enough about law enforcement? When are we going to talk about something really important that matters to me, like when we're going to sing my song again? Now, for the record, it's only the hit dog that yelps. You'll get that around noon. Contrast all of that with the words of the Apostle Paul. I quote, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You guys see the difference there, don't you? Like what the modern church says and what somebody like the Apostle Paul said? You you get the difference. Well, I'm almost finished. Two of you guys are so excited you almost started speaking in tongues. But let me remind you what we're talking about. When disappointment trumps hope. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Life is filled with disappointments. Things don't go well all the time. Things don't turn out the way we think they should. I don't like it either, but here's the truth. People will always disappoint you. The people of God will disappoint you. Leadership among the people of God will disappoint you. You'll be unfairly characterized. You'll be maligned by people who just 10 minutes earlier acted like they really liked you. (laughs) People won't understand your perspective or worse. They won't care. It's disappointing. Life sometimes is hard. You'll face the death of people you love. And in the short run, it might not get better. But in the long run, it's a whole different story. Jesus has done the most beautiful thing, hasn't he? And right after he raises Lazarus from the dead, such a hopeful moment, right? What happens? If you read ahead, in response to the goodness of Jesus and the miracle of Jesus, do you know what the people do? They plot to kill him. This entire 11th chapter of John's Gospel demonstrates what we've been talking about for four weeks. Disappointment trumps hope for a time. Jesus was perfect. I mean, contrary to what Don Lemon on CNN says, Jesus was perfect. He loved everybody. He never lied. He never cheated. He never stole anything. He never sinned. He honored the Father by bringing a dead man back to life, the absolute kindest thing that a person in the world could ever do. And what thanks does he get? The people want to kill him. Disappointment trumps hope but only for a while. Remember, I had us all say, eternity with Jesus. Would you say that again? Eternity with Jesus. And I said I'd have to come back to that. Well, we're back now. I want you to think about, for a moment, your own darkness. What's troubling you right now? What are you afraid of? What are you angry about? What are you frustrated over? In fact, 
if you want to, think about all the disappointments that you can think of from your life right now. Now, we're not going to do anything weird, but if you're comfortable with this, close your eyes for just a moment, and I want you to listen. Because what I'm going to describe, even as you contemplate all of your darkness, all of your disappointment, all that pain, what I'm going to describe is the day when hope eliminates disappointment forever. Think of all the hard things in your life, the heartache, the losses, the pain, and then listen. This is what the Apostle John writes in another book. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away." Disappointment trumps hope, <laughs> but not forever. Would you pray with me? Father, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard for us sometimes. And we're simply repeating something that you know all too well. You hear our heartache when we cry out to you. And you see it even when we don't. Father, I don't know what each of these precious people are dealing with. But I know that whatever challenging circumstances we might be facing, Jesus Jesus deals well with hard things, tough situations, and so we turn to Him in faith. God, I pray for each person in this room. I pray, Lord, for those that might have never experienced the forgiveness that Jesus offers, and I pray that in these moments, that in faith, they would simply turn to You and say, God, I know that I need Your forgiveness. I repent of my sin, I confess it, and I place my faith fully and wholly, completely in Jesus alone for eternity. Father, for your people that need peace, I pray that you'll speak peace to our hearts too. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me remind you that as soon as we finish this morning, some of our staff will be here at the front. We would love the opportunity to talk with you if you need more help in understanding how you can begin a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you'd like to join the church or follow Christ through believer's baptism. Maybe you just want someone to pray with you or for you. We'll be here at the front at the conclusion of our time together. Also, please feel free to call us or email us in our church office. We stand ready to do whatever we can to help you in your walk with the Lord Jesus.